sense that PV will figure in it, but it will figure as a kind of mm, secondary actor, not necessarily as the, uh, as the star in the show. As I get deeper into the talk, I'll talk more about PV. But of course, the policy, most of the policy frameworks really are to do with big issues like energy supply and climate change and things like that. And PV is a part of that story, but of course, uh, it's only um, a, particular, a particular part. So, hmm. yeah. Okay, so this is a brief outline then of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, <clears throat> the energy and climate challenge, which um, I'll only touch on briefly because probably if you're interested in TV, you're already pretty much up to speed on that. Uh, a little bit about um, how we should see technological transitions. So in other words, talking about socio-technical transitions. Um, more on energy and climate policy in Canada, which basically provides a frame within which you can analyze uh, policy around uh, PV. And then, um, again, in a little more detail on uh, the policy world, policy instruments, and frameworks to promote uh, PV. Okay, so briefly on the energy and climate challenge. Well, um, as you all know, we are, our societies are very dependent on fossil fuels. According to the IEA, something like 80% of uh, primary energy is supplied by fossil fuels, uh, if you think about the whole world. Um, and in particular, the transport sector internationally is essentially 100% dependent on fossil fuels. I mean, there's a little bit for biofuels, but it doesn't matter if you're talking cars or trucks or trains or planes. It's all uh, driven by uh, fossil fuels. Now, actually, uh, in Canada, we have in our electricity system a substantial uh, part of uh, hydro, and we have some nuclear, and so on. But internationally, coal and fossil fuels are really uh, key in those sectors as well. So we're dependent on fossil fuels, and um, we know that climate change is a problem. And I'm not going to enter into the whole discussion about climate change, but just to situate it in terms of what are the scale of the necessary reductions that we need to uh, deal with climate change. Now, no doubt you've all seen arguments in the scientific literature, or if not, at least in the media, about um, a two degree target, or four degrees of warming, or six degrees of warming, or whatever. Essentially, what we can say is that probably by mid-century, and you can argue whether it should be a decade or two later, globally, we need to have lost um, at least half of our current fossil fuel dependence. And what that means is in the developed countries, essentially what we need is a carbon-free energy system towards the middle of the century, or maybe it's 2060 or, or whatever, if we're going to uh, avoid some of the more extreme climate change scenarios. So kind of as a societal objective, in a country like Canada, we should basically be aiming for a carbon-free energy system. Um, at least, let me say, a carbon emission-free energy system, because, of course, you could think about things like carbon capture and storage, which is okay if it, if it works and if you deploy it at the, the adequate scale. But from our energy sector, we really just need to stop fossil emissions. And part of that is because other bits of the economy, like agriculture and elsewhere, is very, very hard. It's even harder to squeeze out uh, greenhouse gas emissions than it is CO2 emissions from uh, from the energy sector. So that's the kind of, uh, kind of framework of where we need to go. So the, even the IEA, which historically has been a club of pr petroleum uh, consumers, uh, even the IEA two or three years ago said that uh, kind of issued a call for this, what they call an energy revolution, that we need hundreds of billions of dollars in order to shift uh, off of a fossil fuel uh, trajectory. So I guess the important few things just to say about that. One is that we need uh, social and technological innovation. Um, and I guess another thing to say right away is that there's not one way to resolve this problem. There are many, there are many possible ways to do it. And there are many possible ways to add up to reasonably sophisticated energy systems that provide abundant energy for our needs at reasonable cost, 
but as well as many possible ways of doing it, there are even more ways of not doing it. That's to say, either not uh, squeezing out uh, fossil emissions or uh, finding that you, you have a great deal of difficulty making your energy supply. Um, one of the themes that I'll come back to later on in the talk, um, which is perhaps obvious, is that all energy options have costs and benefits. Or let's turn it around, benefits and costs. Even PV has costs and environmental impacts. Um, and so choices about energy are choices among those options. Um, and developing a kind of portfolio of those options that actually meets energy needs while also uh, squeezing out green, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is, is if you like, the challenge. Um, and this last point really is kind of the major theme for my talk, that the fundamental barriers, barriers are not technological. I mean, of course there are technological uh, barriers. We want to be able to do PV at a quarter of the price or a tenth of the price that we do it now. We want to do it with more benign materials. We want to use it with using less energy for the inputs for the creation, um, for the creation of, the, of the devices. And you can apply the same to all sorts of other e energy technologies. We can't do storage. We need energy. Of course, there are technological problems. But the fundamental problems, um, I will argue, are related to culture, institutions, practices, distributional com com uh, con conflicts. Um, and I'll develop this uh, theme a little bit further uh, later on. But the fact is that we do things in certain ways now, and it's rather hard to shift society off that trajectory. One of the reasons is because there are large groups of people who benefit from the way that we do things now. And any possible change will disrupt that. There will be winners, but there will also be losers. And losers are not enthusiastic about changing the, 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 the energy supply. So I mean, a bit of a trivial example, but the oil companies are not the principal promoters of electric vehicles. Um, but this same type of thing exists throughout society in terms of the way we use, but also the way we consume, uh, the way we uh, consume energy. So I guess the other thing just um, to, to remember is with energy that we're dealing with systems, complex systems, systems embedded with, within systems. So we often think about production, but production is intimately related to consumption. And the two things go together. If, you, if you're going to have a society that uses cars, you need an infrastructure of roads. Once you have an infrastructure of roads, it's cheaper to go by car than it is uh, to use some uh, alternative means of, uh, of, of uh, transport. Oh, I see. Wait a sec. They warned me this would happen. I'd get this little guy. So you roll the mouse away <laughs> like that. Then you push the button on the back. It disappears. And now the whole thing will work again. <laughs> OK. So thank you. Um, they also told me if I practiced it twice, I'd be able to do it like that. But I wasn't. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about socio-technical tr uh, transitions. So really, this is a way of thinking about the kinds of changes that our society needs to go uh, through over the coming uh, decades and probably through to half a century and, uh, and beyond. Um, and the reason I put socio-technical and not just technological is because Obviously, technology is embodied, embedded in society. And it's not just the technical properties of a system that decides whether it gets adopted or not, but all sorts of other things to do with beliefs and consumer preferences and business practices and even uh, luck and uh, contingent circumstances. Um, so let's start a little bit about this, this idea then of socio-technological transition. So if you look back at the histories of technologies, you can see that society has these large technical, socio-technical systems, which are made up of technological artifacts, uh, say a sailing ship or something, <laughs> um, but also all sorts of human agents who are related to those artifacts, and also um, 
all sorts of other social institutions that are involved in them. So there are reg regulatory institutions, training institutions. If you have ships, you have crews, you have systems to license captains to get their papers to use those, you have insurance for the, uh, ships, uh, you have dock facilities, and, tr and, and so on and so on. So each one of these socio-technological systems really is just that. It's a system. It's not just a, a technology. And it's linked into society in, in very many different ways. And if you think back, I mean, a good example of such a transition is, is the shift the shift between sailing ships and steamship. So for us, it's kind of a no-brainer that, well, duh, of course, once they had steamships, they dumped uh, sailing ships. But of course, if you actually go back, the transition between the two actually took something like 60 years or, or even more. The early steamships were pretty bad. Sailing ships were actually uh, way faster. Um, and Steamships penetrated into certain niches. One was there was a military niche, and there were a couple of others. And in fact, if you look at the competition between them, the very best sailing ships were produced in the last 20 years of sail as a commercial thing. They managed to reduce the crews by more than half, and they doubled, just about doubled the speed. And even at the time when steamships really made their breakthrough, sailing ships could get from India to England carrying cotton and stuff like that at almost twice the time it took for a steamship. But sailing ships had one critical weakness, which is if there's no wind, it doesn't go anywhere. So, which is a bit like solar <laughs> if there's no sun. So the, problem, so the problem was that if you were booking a cargo in for a manufacturing plant or something like that, you could not absolutely guarantee the day on which the cargo would arrive because maybe there'd be a storm or unfavorable winds or something like that. So even though the steamships were slower, the steamships more reliably uh, could, uh, could, could deliver. And that helped tip them over in commercial, uh, uh, in commercial application. But the reason I make the point about the best sailing ships, and as I said, they managed to reduce their crews, which push down costs dramatically, being produced in the competition is think about when you're thinking about, say, a new technology like PV, the competition is not a, a steady state. Other people will be constantly trying to green up their products, reduce costs, and so on. And the, usually, for a very long time, the established technology has the advantage over the, the uh, upstart. So one of the things that we see in these periods of uh, transition is that usually there's a, a period at the beginning when a new technological field is opened up where there is intense competition, uh, great pluralism of design, uh, lots of innovation in a very fundamental way. And a good example is the early history of the automobile, which is something like 1880 to 1910, where you had almost every kind of car design that you could imagine were competing to capture the market. So you had steam cars using coal. You had ethanol vehicles using biofuels. You had um, uh, some cars that ran on ca uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, you had cars with four wheels, and you had three wheelers, and you had all this competition between these various fuels and various motor types. And after about a decade or two, it settled down to one dominant design. And this is what you see typically in the development of technology. And the dominant design in this case was internal combustion engine, uh, four wheels, <laughs> basically. Um, and that basically is it. The basic design for the automobile has not really changed. And then, oh, uh, sorry, I should add oil settled out as the, the uh, fossil energy settled out as the fuel. Um, but that was even quite late. So even Ford thought originally that ethanol would be likely to be the fuel of choice for, uh, for the, uh, the Model T. Um, once you get dominant, the d dominant design, the tendency then is to continuously improve that design. And if you think about the car, that's basically what we have. So our cars now have uh, you know, sound, surround sound systems. We have window wipers, and we head have headlights, and we have more sophisticated motors, and so on. But the basic 
core of the artifact has been stable now for about 100 years. And you see this over and over again in, uh, in technology. And this is because of something that you can, uh, we talk about in terms of lock-in, socio-technical lock-in. Once a dominant design becomes established, it's extremely expensive and difficult to shift the whole trajectory onto another path. And what you get is huge investment in the dominant design, thousands of engineers working on perfecting it every year, and some flaky people working on the alternative technology, but maybe only a hundredth of them, you know, maybe only a thousandth of the money value working on that new technology as is going into the one that has a product that's going to market that's selling uh, in, uh, in the thousands. Um, so what you have here then is a kind of ten tension between incremental change and system change. And the fact is that most of the time incremental change works really good and beats system change every time. Because if you can just get a 1% or a 1.5% efficiency gain every year, year on year, over time your product is getting, continues to, to get better and prevents, a, as I said, a moving target for the, the, competi the competition. So these are a few other things you see in these, typically in these uh, transitions. You get cycles of hype where a new technology comes along. People say it's great. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs run around gathering investment capital. They get the money. The first product hits the market. The initial adopters buy it. And it may or may not quite do all the things that it was supposed to do. And very often, uh, for PV, for instance, you can actually chart these investment cycles. And there have already been two or three kind of cycles of hype where it looks like we're going to break through, and then, no, uh, it falls back. Um, I guess the, one of the things I wanted to just point out is in periods where uh, the dominant design is under challenge or where you get uh, new fields emerging are usually periods of considerable uncertainty. And whether you're an investor or a government, it's very hard to know kind of which horse to back. And my suggestion is that, for instance, in the automobile sector, this is an example um, of a period now after about a, a century of a more or less stable design. Now all sorts of people are coming up with all sorts of other suggestions about how we could power automobiles. So we have. Uh, plug-in hybrids, and we have electric vehicles, and then there are other people who are championing, championing biofuels, and then there are some people who say, no, stick with the internal combustion engine because we can, we can do way better in terms of uh, fuel efficiency. We should be able to triple what we get from a conventional engine, uh, and so on. And uh, also we have, of course, hydrogen vehicles. And the thing is that you will see, even when you talk to people who are experts in the field, it's not clear which one of these in 30 years' time is going to succeed in terms of uh, personal transport vehicles. Um, and the last thing I want to say is then about the role of policy and politics in these sorts of transitions. I mean, w first thing that should be clear, when I said aborted transitions, all transitions don't happen. Sometimes incumbent technological re regimes adapt, absorb bits of a new technology, and then things go on more or less uh, as before. In all these transitions, politics and policy plays an important role, if only because the interests on both sides go to politicians and say, well, we have a wonderful new technology. You just need to subsidize this a little bit, and we'll, we'll export to the world, and we'll create thousands of jobs, and so on. And the people of the incumbent technology say, well, you know, that technology is still risky. Uh, we have to stick with what we know how to do. And and of course, as a technology becomes uh, socially uh, more and more widely used, it attracts a regulatory framework which adapts to the technology. So the technology and regulatory framework become interdependent. And new technologies that come up find it hard to get into, uh, get into that game. Now, if we look at, um, you can kind of look back at some of these big technological changes in the U.S. from, in the U.S. or Canada, say, from the development of the internet or the building of the interstate highway system. All these things you can see that lobbying and politics played a, a critical role in easing the path for um, 
uh, emergent uh, technologies. But of course, when we're talking about something like climate change, the politics and policy are even more important because there's no kind of independent commercial reason for getting rid of carbon emissions other than the fact that uh, it drives climate change and for societal reasons, maybe we, want, we don't want climate change. So in other words, as a policy driver, becomes particularly important in energy transitions uh, related around uh, the climate issue. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of switch focus a little bit and talk a little bit about energy uh, and climate policy in Canada. And why, what is kind of particular or peculiar about Canada? Some of these things will apply to other countries, but they're particularly important in the Canadian context. Okay, so the first thing is pretty obvious, but Canada is drowning in energy. Okay, we've got, compared to most countries, we just have so much energy that we hardly know what to do with it. So we've got uh, fossil fuel resources, and we will sell oil, coal, gas. Uh, we've got masses of bio biomass, forests from one end to the other, plus huge agricultural sector. Uh, from which you could uh, use biomass waste. We've got maybe the second or third installed hydro capacity in the world. We're the second or third, depending on how you do it, uranium exporter in the world. Um, if we want it, we've got masses of wind, and if we want it, we've got masses of sun. Um, and when you compare our situation, say, to a country like Denmark uh, or Sweden that have virtually no fossil uh, fuel resources, don't have uranium, uh, and are kind of smaller ge ge uh, geographically, the contrast between the Canadian situation and that of actually most other countries uh, is really quite um, uh, startling. Second thing is that we have a very carbon intensive industrial structure. And this is uh, really related to the long term economic growth of Canada, but also some similar countries, particularly the United States and Australia. Um, these kind of new settler countries, which were settled in the, particularly in the kind of 19th century, um, as their economies grew, the, the principal advantage that we had compared to the old uh, economies of Europe um, was that we had cheap and abundant natural resources and lots of space. So land was cheap. Uh, but so were energy resources and water and so on. So we built the industrial structure that relied on our comparative advantage and we built industries like aluminum smelting and so on, the extractive mining industries and so on, that were well suited to uh, our abundance of natural resources uh, and, and space. The problem is that when you come to the point that you're talking about a carbon constrained world, suddenly those advantages on which you built your whole industrial structure kind of turn into disadvantages because the pressure is to get as much energy efficiency as you can to be most uh, uh, efficient uh, and so on. So if you look at Canada's uh, carbon emissions per capita, um, we are something like uh, three times the level, between three and four times the level of Sweden. So Sweden has, you know, I mean, the climate is not that different. It's not quite as, as, as harsh as our climate. And it's a smaller country, but of course, smaller population. So it's, it's a bit like a Canadian province, perhaps. But the Swedes managed to have a standard of living that is in no way inferior to ours. And some people would argue in some respects their quality of life is actually better than ours at less than a third of our uh, carbon emissions. And one of the things that that illustrates is the, I guess you would call it the path dependence uh, in uh, energy systems. So if you look at, um, um, you're probably all familiar with the idea of combined heat and power or cogeneration, that you have a plant that both uh, makes energy uh, but also uses things like uh, district heating and so on. The earliest plants in in Sweden that were involved in combined heat and power, uh, district energy, and so on, um, date from the, um, from the beginning of the early part of the 20th century. 
So you're talking almost 100 years ago, 80, 80 or 90 years ago, that they began, to, and that was because they didn't have fossil fuel resources, and so they had to be, use their energy uh, uh, efficient, efficiently. And of course, then Sweden made, after the 1970 uh, oil crisis, Sweden brought in a whole lot of energy efficiency measures in order to get off oil as much as possible and dependence on fossil fuels. And they carried those through, whereas most of the other industrialized countries relaxed on energy efficiency measures uh, by the time you got into the 1980s when the oil prices were, had relatively declined. So this kind of shows that the, we actually have a real difficulty because for you know, more than half a century we've been building one kind of economy and we're realizing now that we actually need a somewhat different type of economy. So it poses uh, a significant challenge. Third point I want to make is that we have a very regionally differentiated uh, resources and, and, and energy supply. So if you go from one side of the country to the other, it, they, it really is different, and it's as different as between any number of European countries. So in Quebec, the electricity supply is essentially hydropower. In, in Alberta, it's essentially coal. I mean, there are nuances, but that's kind of the, the general thing. Ontario has got one of the most mixed systems that you can find anywhere. About 50% of the generation actually comes now from nuclear, but there's a 20 plus that comes from hydro, uh, and then the rest is mostly gas and coal with a little bit of uh, new re renewables now <coughs> coming in. So when you talk about energy in Canada, it really is quite different. Now, of course, there's similarities. We all put gas in our car, and we all, um, we all you know, expect the lights to go on, the electricity the system, the supply system to go on in our houses and for our appliances and so on. But where that electricity system is quite different and also how the province makes its money out of energy is quite different. So Quebec sells hydro to the US, Alberta sell, so, sells oil uh, to the US. Frag policy fragmentation and jurisdictional co complexity. It's no, um, it's not much of an exaggeration to, see, to say that among the developed countries, we have the most fragmented energy policy system. So for the most part, energy is a provincial issue because resources are provincial according to the Constitution and property uh, basically is provincial according to the Constitution. The federal government has some authority in into provincial commerce and in the north and uh, through, through the environment and so on and in the seas on both sides. But by and large, the energy file is in the first instance a, a provincial file. Uh, another thing to be said in this is that um, even with, within this, uh, there are different regulatory bodies that look after oil and gas and other people look after uh, uh, nuclear issue and so on, so it's fragmented that way. And also during the, 19, the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, a number of provinces uh, introduced uh, forms of deregulation or privatization in their electricity systems. So the dominant model through the 1980s was a provincial monopoly uh, like Hydro-Quebec that ran the electricity system. Um, but these were taken apart um, Ontario is the best uh, example where we have a kind of hybrid system with a part market and part private players uh, but with an important role for central, central steering. And that has changed, if you like, some of the levers that government uh, traditionally applied uh, in the energy sector. Um, this one I, is pretty quick. Increasingly, uh, energy markets in North America are integrated. Um, it came first in uh, oil and then in gas, and of course the electricity, so our grid is integrated with the US grid, and we're part of the, this kind of, our grid areas are managed from the security point of view in an integrated system with the US, and we export power to the US. So you can't really look at the energy system in Canada completely in, in isolation from the North American context. Um, well, this one's pretty simple. Um, basically, 
the story is that we have been stuck on climate policy for something like uh, 15 years. Canada has talked a lot about it. We've had all sorts of kind of minor incentive programs and things like that. But in terms of actually taking policy measures, in particular, I'll come back on this in a sec, on the question of pricing carbon emissions, we have been unable to do uh, very much. Um, the story of this is, is very long and complicated, and I won't bore you with going over it all. But it doesn't, I mean, the, the, the kind of short version is it doesn't really matter the color of, or the flavor of the government, the federal government. It's always hesitated when it came the moment to actually do something in a strong regulatory or, or pricing uh, sense. Um, you know that Chrétien signed up to the Kyoto Protocol. Um, one of the problems with that was that before signing up, he'd made a deal with provincial leaders about what level of emission abatement to secure. At the meeting, he didn't want to be eclipsed, basically, Canada to be eclipsed by the US, so the feds upped what the goal was. The provincial leaders said, well, you know, you broke it, you fix it. And so then, essentially, what happened was the federal government introduced some incentives and education programs. But every time it came up to actually doing something serious, they looked at the file and said, well, this is just like too, too much trouble. Great idea. We're still committed, but let's do it next year. And they kept putting this off. And of course, the more you put it off, the more the target that you, look, you, you set looks impossible to do until finally um, the present government came in and said, oh, we can't make Kyoto because we'd bankrupt the country because the target's way up there and we're way down there. Um, Mark Jacquard, who's um, uh, an economist and climate uh, anal analyzer, sorry, analysis <laughs> at uh, Simon Fraser University, has a lovely uh, graph in which he puts Canada's climate objective. And the basic thing you see in the graph is that our emissions go up without cease at the same curve since 1990, 1980 to today. And each time we fixed a new target, we fixed it lower than the previous target. So each time our objectives get more ambitious, and each time it has no effect whatsoever on the curve. The only thing that has affected the curve is the 2008 recession, where just at that point, we, we level off and just start to look like we're dropping. And nobody really knows. It'll be another two or three years at least before we know whether it was just the recession or whether structural changes in the economy related to that recession don't redo it. So put it crudely, if we lose enough industrial jobs <laughs> and they don't come back again and the economy moves more towards a service in the recovery to the extent that the recovery comes, it might be that the curve will Will be uh, will be less less steep, but nobody knows the answer. Uh, the answer to that. Um, right. Well, this follows from that. Uh, even the companies that, and there were Canadian companies that were quite gung ho on trying to do some things uh, in the early 2000s. Some of them got burned because the government never followed through with regulations like they said they did. So then. The companies reduced their emissions, but got no credit for reducing their emissions. So now they say, when, when there's a law, or uh, when there's a tax, we'll talk. But you know, until then, you're just asking us to slit our throats for nothing. Um, and of course, well, this is pretty obvious. The US is not enormously interested at the present time in doing anything on the climate change, uh, on the climate change file. So part of the... The underlying thing, no doubt, over the past has been if the US isn't going to do it, should Canada do something that will raise our costs? Um, and that's been implicitly there, but the present government uh, has actually said it explicitly. There's no point in Canada doing anything until we do it in a uh, North, American, a North American context. Um, of course, the, 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 the difficulty of doing anything without the US is exaggerated for rhetorical purposes. Because as some of you perhaps know, BC, for instance, has introduced a carbon tax uh, 
and so far the BC economy has not sunk into a hole and uh, all the companies have been ruined or anything. So obviously the fact that the US is our major trading partner puts a constraint on what Canada could do, but I don't think it necessarily means that we, could, we can't do anything until. Um, and lastly, I would just say that compared to some countries, there's a relative lag in our movement towards a low carbon economy. And I would say on the whole, the European countries, not all of them, but particularly some of the northern European countries have kind of made more of an effort and are you know, perhaps a decade ahead of us in terms of both regulation and driving some of the technological changes. I'm particularly thinking of countries like Sweden, Denmark, also the United Kingdom, uh, Germany. Um, some of the southern European countries have been much slower, but even there, something a country like Spain, solar has recently, and, and Italy, solar has recently uh, made a lot of progress and wind as well. Right now, of course, with the kind of the economic turmoil in Europe, climate change is kind of the last thing on the politicians' uh, 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 radar. But sometimes you'll hear people say, um, oh, well, Canada hasn't done much, but nobody else does too, has done anything much too. And besides, it's all the Chinese. They're building so many coal-fired power stations, it doesn't matter what we do. So I think that that's like wrong in like, multiple dimensions. Firstly, it isn't true that everybody has had trouble. This is a really big, uh, a really big challenge. There's no doubt about that. But it's not true that all countries have, some countries have done something and others have done not very much. And the Chinese example is definitely true. China is uh, pursuing crash industrialization and they're definitely building lots of coal plants. But they're also actually building windmills <laughs> and solar too. Um, and uh, we shouldn't also forget still that despite their rapid development, our GNP per capita is still like four or five times uh, what, what there is, theirs is. So the industrial countries, I think, it's quite easy to say, well, we won't do anything until someone else does anything. But of course they say, well, we won't do anything until you do anything, which just is really an excuse for um, nobody doing anything. <laughs> Um, and I'll say one more thing. I don't want to get into the whole climate, international climate negotiations, but I can't resist one quick sideswipe, which is as follows. You will often hear people say, well, we can't do much on climate change because the international negotiations are paralyzed. And because we can't have an international agreement, we can't do anything. But what's important to grasp is that it's not that we aren't doing anything because there isn't an international agreement. It's there isn't an international agreement because we don't want to do anything. In other words, if countries were actually serious about aggressively pursuing this, you would think, see things like trade sanctions against countries that don't introduce equivalent uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction. You would, see, you would actually see this issue as an issue of conflict, but it isn't really an issue of conflict because it's more an issue of conclusion that nobody really, or, or the dominant players, and here particularly the US is guilty with Canada as the cheering section, don't want to push this, uh, don't want to push this right now. And incidentally, this question of border tax adjustments will almost certainly come in the future because that, when the United States does decide that climate change is a problem that they want to engage with, and because countries live in a physical world, at some point this decision will, will be made. You will, we will see border tax adjustments, it will be in the core bill that brings in uh, carbon pricing in the United States. And it will be set up so that if country X is deemed not to be equi imposing equivalent carbon price, then we will impose that tariff at the border um, uh, on, the, on, the, on those those goods. And in fact, in every climate change measure so far that's been introduced into the House, the Rep House of Representatives in the US, border tax adjustments have been a central plank, which is also a little bit of a warning with Canada. We can say, well, we want to wait and synchronize with the US, but we better not be behind the US, otherwise we're going to find that our products are being uh, subject to that border taxes. Okay, so that was that. So. Now I'll say a little bit about um, policy. I, I will one day get to TV. 
<laughs> but first I'm gonna say a little bit about some of the features of the policy world. And I'm just making these points because I know a lot of you have science or engineering backgrounds and have never kind of <coughs> formally kind of looked at some of these political science-y type questions. So often, and I've you know taught like lots of classes to engineers and so on where I, like I've done an introdu introduction to environmental policy or something for engineers and things like that. And the point is that you've kind of got to forget most of what you know about engineering because people don't work like reasonable rational systems. And the policy world doesn't work like a reasonable, it, it has a rationality and a logic, but it's not the logic that one's used to in terms of uh, physical processes or engineered systems or whatever. So the first point that I make then is that one can talk about different kinds of, of, of rationalities. Now, of course, behind that, there is a difference between rational and irrational. But what is rational in a different context is, is very, very different. So I mean, I'll give you a kind of simple um, example. If uh, we're doing a business transaction, and I say, Raphael, I'll give you an extra 10,000 bucks. He could look at that and say, yeah, okay, it's a deal, okay. But if I'm in a court of law, and Raphael is the judge, and I say, can I give you an extra 10,000 bucks for the judgment to go my way? he's going to be upset and I'm going to be arrested. So exactly <laughs> the same thing, exactly the same thing is irrational, even though logically it's still, I'm offering him 10,000, it's the same thing, but it isn't the same thing. So in politics, you can think about politic, political rationality and administrative rationality as quite different from scientific or engineering uh, rationality. So obviously, politicians are interested in getting elected. They also want to do good for the country and they have beliefs and things like that. But there's a tension between, because the electors may not think, actually like the solution that the politician actually is, has close to their heart. So there's some uh, tension there. Administrative rationality is usually thought in terms of efficiency, uh, lowest budget, uh, the ease of administering a program and so on. Um, but very often in public policy we get programs that are not the cheapest, not the most effective way to achieve the objective. Well, why is that? Why would we spend more than the necessary to get a certain thing? Why would we um, have, have an objective but then find that the program that we're pouring the money into actually isn't achieving the objective? Or is it, well, part of it, I mean, there are many reasons, but part of because uh, political decisions are usually complex, there are many participants, uh, you can't always say what you really want. You can't always say what you really mean or people feel they can't because they will get um, uh, pushback. Many times the policies actually have multiple goals. So economists are constantly saying the most cost effective solution is X. But then the government went ahead and did Y. Why they did Y <laughs> is because politically it made sense even if it didn't make sense uh, from an economic uh, point of view or a scientific point of view and so on. Okay, incremental and disjointed decision making. It's obvious that the best way to make an energy system is to make a plan. Look at all the needs, look at what we have, put the two together, start, build, roll. For the most part, politics doesn't work like that and policy doesn't work like that because you're always starting from the condition that already is. Um, big changes are extremely hard to get through so people concentrate on little changes. Uh, something like the Obama health care plan uh, is a good example of this. This is an attempt at a really, really big change. But the really, really big change that came out at the end of the sausage factory isn't exactly the really big change that Obama or certainly some of the Democrats went, wanted exactly when they went into the whole process because so many people tinker it and you have to adjust it to keep this constituency on side and, uh, and so on. Policy cycle and issue attention. Um, generally, people argue that the public can only keep its mind on one or two things at a time. And it tends to change because it tends to get displaced by other events. So if you look at uh, interest in climate change or interest in the environment, there's public opinion, these pollsters have these beautiful curves from 1960 
and it goes up for a couple of years, and then a bunch of stuff gets passed, and then it decays as people say, oh, the government's doing something, that's good, and then an economic crisis comes, or a war, and it goes down, and 20, 25 years later, it comes up again. So this exists in most fields, and it's called the issue attention cycle. Um, generally, major reforms only take, the need for a reform isn't enough. You've got to have several things that happen at once. You've got to have a, a kind of window of opportunity. You've got to have all the things kind of have to ha align. Entrepreneurs who will push it forward um, and a solution. Because no politician wants to start attacking a problem without a solution. So you need a solution <laughs> and a problem and the entrepreneurs all to line up at the same time, which is why we have lots of problems in society that you can think about, all sorts of social problems that hang around for decades without much uh, solution, uh, solution happening. Um, I don't know if I gave, yeah, go on. Um, multiple and overlapping policy objectives. Almost no policy is pursue, pursued for one reason. They're pursued for lots of reasons, and since you're, a lot of you are engineers, probably you know it's hard to optimize for multiple things uh, very successfully. So. Energy policy is a great example. What do we want from energy policy? We want energy security, probably the most important thing. When you flick on the switch, the lights have got to work. We want cheap energy, because we don't want to spend too much. We want green energy, of course, because we don't want climate change, we don't want environmental, but that's not enough. We also want economic development. We want jobs from our energy industry. Oh, and we need regional economic development, because there's regional inequalities and we can't leave some province or region discriminated against, and so on and so on. So have these multiple things, which when you trade them off, can end up giving quite perverse results. And layering of policy approaches is simply that. You never start from new, you always start with what's there before and graph something onto it, so the result can be quite illogical. And the last point here is just remember that a lot of politics is about the relationship between diffuse and concentrated interests. By the diffuse interests, I mean the interests that the public have in good government or a climate that isn't crazy out of control uh, or good public services or whatever versus the very particular interests of the guys who run coal-fired power plants or um, any other particular interest, whether it's a trade union or a company or the farmers. And what you find is that concentrated interests are much more successful at bending policy to their ends than are diffuse interests. So you get something like in the US where you have a massive fuel ethanol industry, which is essentially of dubious value for climate change. Uh, maybe you could make a bit more of an argument in terms of energy security, i.e. reducing oil import. Um, costs a huge amount of money and is basically a massive subsidy program to farmers. But once that subsidy program gets embedded, the farmers are powerful enough to overcome the general interest of average Joe Blow who doesn't know much about ethanol and says, oh, well, maybe it's a good idea, versus the lobbyists of multi-million dollar farm in, uh, uh, enterprises who are pushing to maintain or to expand, expand this policy. Okay, so See how I can wrap it on forever. Uh, let me just say, this is, these are, there are different ways to present this, but when you're thinking about policy, these are ways that uh, politicians can, or political leaders, governments can influence behavior. So regulatory is easy, ban it, uh, make a rule. Uh, Ontario has said, we are phasing out coal-fired po coal power station. It will not be legal to generate power by coal uh, in 2014 or, or whenever. Regulation can achieve a lot. Uh, economists often talk about this as command and control regulation. Financial, okay, taxes, easy. Something you don't like, you tax it. Something you do like, give a subsidy. And market, various market-based instruments, um, which uh, people particularly think about tradable permits, which I'll come back to in a second. Information and education, tell people you should use less electricity. Um, you should put solar 
panels on your house because it will contribute to the environment or, or whatever. And the last one is negotiated agreements, which are kind of agreements between government and industry or government and individuals to achieve certain uh, performance standards. Um, I'm not going to go in. This is just kind of up there. I won't discuss them at length. But each of these has advantages and disadvantages. In some ways, the simplest is a regulation, but it's not necessarily the most cost effective. So economists will argue that usually market-based instruments not subsidies in this case, but either t the use of the tax system uh, or trading systems are more uh, uh, cost effective. So mixed portfolios usually achieve better results. So even if you pass a regulation, it's better to do some education <laughs> with the regulation. Otherwise, you find that people uh, will ignore it. OK. so. Cashing that out in terms of policy instruments for a low carbon economy. So the main thing that for years governments have done is basically R&D expenditure. The idea is drive the technology, and when it becomes cost, uh, good enough, it will become cost competitive, and it will displace the old technology that you don't like. Um, one thing to say about that is that there was a huge growth in these budgets uh, after the original oil crisis. It tailed off from the 1980s on. In most countries, even as late as a few years ago, R&D budgets in energy have still not got back up to the high point they reached uh, in the 70s in real uh, dollar terms. And in some countries, in the interim, a huge amount of money was absorbed by things like fusion research. Uh, which took the, the, the lion's share of that. Product standards, that's just an example of regulation, but regulations that can make a big difference. So you put standards for fridges, standards for insulating houses, standards, all sorts of standards you can achieve lots of uh, emissions reductions with. OK, carbon tax and admi admissions permits. This is really the basic kind of thing that would be my test for whether a country is serious or not about doing something about emissions reductions would be, have you put a price on carbon? And the idea here is that if you price it, you will achieve reductions at a lower cost to the economy as a whole than if you just ban certain technologies. Because with a price, people will, individual factory owners or whatever will decide What's the best way? Should I buy permits, or should I try and install pollution control devices, or, or whatever? Portfolio standards. Many countries used these in the 90s, particularly uh, the UK is an example. The United States is an example. These essentially, you just the utility is given a, a standard um, which they must meet. So the rule might be, in five years' time, 20% or 10% of your electricity must come from renewable sources or green sources or low carbon sources or, or whatever. And it's left up to the utility to decide how they're going to meet this target. And in some cases, you can combine this with a trading system where the utility, if it has trouble doing it, won't do it, but some other utility will overfulfill, and so they can buy credits back and forth. So feed-in tariffs is what everybody likes today. Um, these were pioneered in Germany. Um, and essentially, it's an obligation on the part of the electricity uh, supply company to buy electricity at a fixed cost um, for a set period of time. So it's a form of subsidy of a technology that you uh, want to promote. Now, portfolio standards and feed-in tariffs um, can both be considered of driving the same sort of objective, but they incentivize in slightly uh, different ways. Um, there are also um, uh, various forms of standard, standard off, uh, uh, contracts uh, uh, which can be used. The, the great advantage with feed-in tariffs is that because the revenue is guaranteed, uh, if I'm a small producer, I want to put up three windmills, I can go to the bank and say, look, once this windmill is set up, I'm guaranteed so much price for 15 years, so you see the money is there to pay back the loan, uh, and so on. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit now about the on Ontario experience uh, with the Green Energy Act, because this is the Canadian jurisdiction that has kind of most uh, aggressively uh, pursued this. 
Um, so a couple of years back, uh, just after the recession hit, uh, the Ontario government uh, introduced the uh, Green Energy Act. They'd actually been experimenting with various forms for promoting uh, wind energy in particular, but solar as well, uh, for the couple of years before. Um, it's very important to say that for the McGuinty government, this was seen as uh, a kind of response to the crisis, and particularly the fear of loss of manufacturing jobs in the auto sector. So the idea is kind of, if we can make Ontario a center for the green economy, um, it will be a leader in green energy. So not only it's not just seen as kind of an energy option for the province, but as an energy export industry that will be a leader in uh, North America, the way, say, Germany was a, uh, uh, a leader in Europe. So the act did various things. The most, perhaps, the best known is the introduction of this fit and the microfit. And the difference between the two is basically simply one of scale. Microfit is particularly generous subsidies to very small scale. Uh, energy production. So this is if you were going to put some solar panels on your roof or uh, have a small uh, scale development, this is what you would go, uh, this is what you would go after. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of these, of, of the programs because they're fairly easy to find. Um, I can refer you to the website of something called ONSEP, O-N-S-E-P, which is the Ontario Network for Sustainable Energy Policy. And there are about 15 papers there. Um, I think they're mostly PowerPoints, but they show all this, this stuff that are dealing in various ways with the Green, Ener uh, Green Energy Act in uh, quite a lot of detail. Um, at the meeting the other day, I showed, uh, I put up some graphs about how uh, rapid uh, the uptake of the renewable e energy was. Basically, wind has, has made quite a lot of progress. PV also has made some progress. But I, I guess the key point was to show that really the, the, the phase-out of coal is being matched by a rise-up of gas. And that the green, the actual real, what I would call the green component, is still kind of barely a couple of percentages of uh, installed, uh, installed capacity. Um, as you know, in the last provincial election, uh, there was quite a lot of debate about the Green Energy Act and the FIT program in particular. And it's also worth noting that there's been um, yeah, quite a lot of opposition in Ontario, particularly to wind. This has come from, um, uh, I would say, mainly rural-based um, uh, uh, organizations. Um, and the I mean, just the kind of anecdote is that we, Ontario actually has a chair, a research chair in the health effects of wind, which is, to my knowledge, the only such research chair in the world. And we don't have a research chair in wind <laughs> uh, uh, energy. Or there are some chairs who do bits of wind energy. But, um, and this health angle is the one that has been most pursued most vociferously lately. Though, in fact, the original objections by people are much more to do actually with sighting, uh, with visu visual intrusion, with noise, with the effects of the construction and so on. So the basic underlying problem here that you have, well, there, there are a couple of them. One is that if you're moving from large centralized energy production facilities like nuclear plants and coal plants to uh, energy systems that rely on harnessing renewable resources, particularly wind and solar, you need way more of them. Because the energy is distributed, um, they're going to be, the turbines won't be all in one place. They're going to be tens of thousands of turbines. So whereas um, only a small number of people um, will be situated right close to a nuclear plant, many, many large numbers of people will be inside of um, a turbine or whatever. Um, so this, this is one of the, the other thing of course that particularly the conservative, I'm going to wrap up, particularly the conservatives uh, emphasized in the last election was the cost. So it was more than 80 cents a uh, kilowatt for the, uh, for the uh, feed in tariff, for the micro fit for uh, PV. And lots of people say, well, you know, it's driving up electricity prices. It's going to ruin us all. Why are we paying so much? Um, 
And so I guess the point there is simply that in designing these policies, the devil is in the details. You really have to be very careful not to look like you're giving a free lunch to the first people to bail in. I should say that in some of the earlier policies before the FIT, the way that because the, of the way they were set up, it was the big developers that were able to get in quick. They had the most engineering capacity, lawyers, planners, and they could bail in quick and clogged up the system before kind of little local uh, groups and so on. Also in Europe, a lot of emphasis has been on, put on community development, particularly in wind, but also in solar. Because people feel differently about something when they can say, oh look, you know, that's our wind turbine owned by our village or our co-op or whatever it is, than when, oh, look at those 30 turbines. They're owned by XYZ Energy Corp based in wherever it happens to be based. So a lot of these policies, the question is about how to actually do the design so that you implicate local people and get them involved. Yes, you want me to wrap up? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll stop there, and there's a couple of uh, time for questions. I'm sorry, I didn't realize we were going to be ch chucked out. <laughs> first, first, let's thank uh,